and, and, and environmental change. Uh, that means we need to train a whole new generation of data scientists, frankly, with slightly different skills. Yes, great technical skills, but also skills in social sciences, interdisciplinary skills. So they, they are able to ask the right questions and be aware of the longer term consequences of what they do, which is really, really uh, important if they will be successful in social impact problems. Mm. And Maria, your role at PwC gives you the opportunity to talk with, you know, g global business leaders uh, around the potential mm. of these technologies in their own businesses, but also in the societies that those businesses operate in. What do you see from those discussions? I is, this, is this ambition that Daniel and Juan have just articulated, is it moving forward in those conversations that you have? Certainly is, but going back to your first question, it's like, hey, it doesn't need to do more. We need to do more. Mm -hmm to understand AI, aligning with our goals, being optimization, being able to solve climate change, but also being able to work with it. We have a technology that is, has agency, that adapts to its um, external environment, that operates without, increasingly without human supervision, drifts because it's a non-deterministic. So how do we work with this type of artifacts and understand why do we need to fine tune it? When do we understand that we need to have some KPIs in place to be able to monitor it? And also don't freak out when things will go wrong. How can we embrace the, uh, the culture of cyber, fail and address very quickly? Because there will be things that go wrong, which is okay as long as we redress it quickly. And to me, that's the big point is like AI is a technology. As I heard it yesterday in my panel, software engineering. Let's treat it in this way, but also do our job, really understand what sort of goals we need to align it, and also understand the magic behind the box, you know, all the correlation the machines do and they are for us incapable to understand. And stop, move away from making it a sensational topic like being conscient or taking over or... But also I want to touch the subject Elon Musk because I don't want us to forget about Elon Musk. <laughs> and no matter what opinions we have about Elon Musk, he's a visionary, and we need vision. We need to see where this is going. How do we uh, use technology to make the world a better place? And if we don't have a vision, we are not able to see the big picture. And that's what I like about Elon Musk, is that he is contested, but he attempts to break the status quo. How many times in the world of ethics we say, we need to challenge the boundaries, we need to challenge the status quo. So then why do we penalize Elon Musk for saying the same thing? We want things to change. How do you change things? Challenging the boundaries. Mm. So let's not forget about Elon Musk because we can learn a bit of two, a thing or two from him, right? So I'm hearing a real strong uh, agreement across the panel that AI has real scope and capability mm. to address some of these societal good issues that we feel we should be applying it to. But in order to unlock that, we need to do things differently, whether it's, as you've just made the point, Maria, you know, dreaming differently, thinking differently, being challenging, or whether it's uh, developing new methods of working, new interdisciplinary methods of working, or indeed addressing some of the structural and technical issues. I'd like to come back to all of those questions as we have this discussion today. But the first question I want to ask, and I, I ask this very much from our experience in the R squared factory working to look at the application of AI to industrial problems, do we actually have the right quality of data to even get into this topic? Juan, I know you've done some work on this. Yes, yeah, so uh, I think we need to compare the situation in um, an e-commerce store like Amazon that's using industrial AI to make recommendations, uh, and optimize its logistics, compare that with the situation in education, like mm. schools in the UK. Uh, you have one Amazon, you have one big machine that collects data, models it, makes predictions. In the case of schools, we have, what, 32,000 schools in the UK. Each of them is collecting data in a slightly different ways, sometimes not collecting data, not analyzing it, not checking its quality. So basically, you have this very fragmented data ecosystem that uh, makes it very difficult to integrate data in order to train any kind of machine learning model. Uh, we, can't do, we can't even do small data AI with that kind of data, so that's an issue. Um, uh, just to give you an example of a, a situation I faced uh, trying to collaborate with a school where we wanted to identify, use machine learning to identify amazing teachers that we could learn from. Mm -hmm. We would want to identify the, those outliers to learn um, what they do and use that to train other teachers. 
um, we found that they hadn't connected data about classrooms with teachers. So we couldn't actually even figure out what teacher was t teaching what students, and it was impossible to implement this method. Uh, and this was actually quite an advanced one. Like, it wasn't one of the like, ones that's lagging behind. That's the reason why we were talking with them. So the data is just not, it's fragmented, and even inside organizations, it's not connected in a way that we can really use to do uh, data science for social impact. Mm -hmm. And Daniel, I, I know that data.org has done a lot of work looking at how to pull together the sorts of, of data collaborations that can underpin some of this activity. I'm really interested in, in something one of your colleagues wrote around the challenges facing us from the, the need to decolonize data, which I thought was a really yep. interesting idea. Could you explain a little bit about what that <coughs> means and maybe how that shows up in your work? Sure, absolutely. So uh, Rhonda Disney Green um, wrote an excellent blog about it. Um, the, the, one of the issues we have is that a lot of the uh, analysis, the innovation, the, the creation of tools, the generation of demand around data happens in the global north. Um, unfortunately, it, what it means is we're not investing in capacity building in low and middle income countries, but often we also extract data from low and middle income countries in a way which doesn't give value back to those countries. So we're not investing, number one, and we're extracting, number two. That's where the, the issue of colonialism uh, comes across. It happens in data like 200 years ago and happened in, in other resources extraction. So um, that is a very big problem because what it does is undermines trust uh, uh, around those communities because they, they don't see the value going back to, to them um, in the way that would encourage their own local, local economies, uh, local skills, uh, skills growth. Mm -hmm. So I think the problem of data colonialism and how, how uneven the spread of uh, investment is across the world is, is, is a really big one. It'll, it, it, it hurts us massively. So for example, in, uh, in, uh, during the pandemic, uh, what we needed to do in the scientific community is share data around the emergence of new variants as fast as possible. But of course, um, data sharing is very hard if, you, if, if as soon as you give your data away, the value doesn't come back. Mm. Data sharing is also very hard where you're punished for sharing it. So in South Africa, for example, uh, uh, famously, and, and we should be all hugely grateful to, to them, have analyzed and saw the rise of Omicron variant. The first thing that happened is all countries closed their borders to South, Afri mm. South, Af South African travel. So we actually punished the country for putting the investment in building the data in infrastructure to be able to analyze and detect a variant. Um, so those kind of things uh, are really, really destructive and, and harm trust. Mm -hmm. and, and Maria, uh, help us understand you know, what the risks are if we don't get you know, th this right, if we don't think more clearly about how we, how we work on developing artificial intelligences for these social programs of work with, with the right good in mind. I know that, that, uh, that in your work for PwC mm. around AI ethics, that's you know, been yeah. fundamental to, to thinking about both the context and, and the technical delivery of ethical think, AI. Um, <clears throat> obviously, we need to have a taxonomy of risk and really understand it. There are many industries that wouldn't have a mature um, risk management because they didn't have to. Um, and I would say that I'm quite concerned that looking at an application of AI, especially in public sector, they wouldn't have a discipline called risk management. And I was working with ICO and they produced the AI in data uh, risk management toolkit. And one of the concerns I highlighted is that we, we need to build capacity of understanding and managing risk, which is more compliance. So really understanding that AI needs to have a layer of compliance attached to it. Um, but in order to really understand the risk we need to go a step, uh, take a step back and understand the com consequences, both um, positive and unintended um, uh, and intended, but also positive and negatives, and start from there at, at each context. Yes, you can categorize risk into risk that have to do with the application, risk to do that are that application will augment the risk existing with an organizational societal risk. But really, it's really good to have a clear taxonomy so that we know exactly who addresses them. Some of the risk, like risk of bias or um, explainability, the black box, can be addressed by technical experts. But when we talk about risk of um, job displacement, for example, or risk of reputational risk that's attached with misuse of technology by companies, that's not something that the data scientists could do. It's an unfair to 
tag that risk or the risk mitigation to them when this is more assigned to those who own the technology or business leaders. I think that we need to be thinking what are the risks, but also think about building an ecosystem to address the risk, I would say, in a more organic manner. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, keep on saying the best way to mitigate the risk in AI is consider ethics from the start. The best mitigation of risk of AI is really think about ethics because if you are looking into the biasing, the best thing you can do is actually start early and say, what sort of fairness would I aspire to have in the outcome I produce with my models? Thank you, Maria. And, and I'd really like to just lean a little bit more into that question about, about how we mitigate some of those risks that you've, that you've called out there. One, one of the things that I found very interesting in some of the, the writing that, of yours that I was reading was th this challenge that you raise around whether we're really using the right ML techniques in these contexts with these types of data to start with. So talk to us a little bit about you know, how some of the, the kind of the big AI techniques, um, the complex and, and opaque AI techniques may not really be risk appropriate for the use cases that we're describing when we're talking about social and, and health use cases. Help us understand that a bit. Yes, yeah, so I guess the, the way I think about it is, is uh, as a data scientist, I guess I have a toolkit. And I have different tools in that toolkit. And, and one of those tools is big language models and things like that. And actually, I can use them for some things. But for example, we use them a lot when we are trying to map a domain where there's a lot of unstructured data. Mm -hmm. And for example, we have created maps of jobs that are exposed to automation, where we analyze online job adverts and the text descriptions of those adverts to see what jobs are close to what jobs and how people in a job that is exposed to automation might be moving to other jobs. We're doing something similar now, mapping, mapping food to identify opportunities for reformulation uh, of different foods in a way that makes them healthier. Deep learning, great for that. Mm -hmm. However, if you're in a situation where you want to uh, put in place an intervention, like for example, for um, a child in the care system, identify uh, children at risk, uh, or in the criminal justice system, people who might jump bail. Actually, in that context, uh, you need to not just be able to predict, you need to be able to explain mm -hmm. the situation so that we are able to understand why the model is making a recommendation. Mm. Um, uh, and also, so that we can think about, um, it's almost like in a more sophisticated way about, about uh, what we might do about the prediction. Uh, just to give you an example, there's a very nice uh, paper by this MIT uh, researcher called Chelsea Barabas, who looked at um, predictive and explanatory models in the criminal justice system. What she was saying there is that if you use purely predictive models just to predict someone is at risk of uh, recidivism, then the only intervention that you are going to be able to come up with is to deny them bail so that they don't uh, jump bail. Mm. If you have models which are, allow you to explain what are the drivers for that person jumping bail, mm. then you can put in place interventions which are going to change their context and change their situation in a way that addresses the outcome without sending them to jail, mm -hmm. which we know is more likely to is, is going to increase the, the likelihood that they become longer-term criminals. So we need to put causality back in as well as causality. Is, exactly. Is, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Daniel, help us. You, in the work that you do, you address some of these risks that Maria's articulated, as I understand it through this interdisciplinariness, is that a word? Anyway, it'll do for now. H help us understand, how does that mitigate some of these, these issues that are being raised and the risks that result from these issues? Sure, I can give you a, um, both a, a macro and a, and a micro um, explanation of it. So, uh, so uh, taking our start from what, what Juan just said, in that example Juan gave, in order to do an explanatory uh, intervention, you need to have the technical skills, but you also need to understand what interventions would work once you have the results of the analysis. Those are skills from humanities and so social sciences. So that's the point about interdisciplinarity. In order to have the right outcome, the right impact in the world, you need scholars across those dis disciplines collaborating closely together. So you need social scientists, behavioral scientists, um, economists, policymakers, uh, working much, much closer than they currently are 
with technologists. Uh, otherwise, what you do is do the analysis. You might establish the cause, the explanation, but you don't have then the right action following mm. straight away. Um, so that's kind of the macro example of, of how to bring it together. You need, if you like, to invest in those interdisciplinary skills. One of the things Datadog is doing at the moment is we are um, building hubs across the world, particularly focused on low middle income countries, to train a new generation of data scientists with those interdisciplinary skills. Mm -hmm. So the curricula we're introducing have modules not just in, in, in hard, hard coding skills, in statistics, in, in Python, etc., but also skills relevant to the social impact world how to work with vulnerable communities, how to formulate the right question, which, which come more from social sciences. So that's kind of on a macro level. On a micro level, I used to manage a tech team uh, in my prior job in Welcome Data Labs. Uh, Juan knows we've collaborated uh, before. Um, and we did an experiment in, the, in that team. So we had, you know, uh, it's, it's a full-on AI product team. We had data scientists, software engineers, um, designers, UX, etc., working to produce products. Um, we introduced... Uh, a social scientist into the mix. Uh, so we embedded a social scientist into that team, and, and not just in a, in, in a, in a way that uh, you know, every now and again somebody comes in and does a critique, but actually a person works with them following the agile life cycle, so the rhythm of the team. And it took a long time. It took a long time for them to gel because they, they, they come from different cultures, different languages. They didn't speak fundamentally the right language together. So after so there was a lot of kind of initial misunderstandings, but over time we persevered, and over time a common language started to develop between the social scientists and, and, and the tech experts. And they started, for example, um, asking different questions about, okay, how do we set the th threshold in this model? Like, are we, are we, uh, what, what exactly do we care about? Mm -hmm. They got an understanding that making a very technical decision, what they thought was a very technical decision, has a social consequence down, downstream. So that, that, kind of, that kind of experimentation, how do we work together, how do we build interdisciplinarity, is really important. It is not easy. It took us a lot, a lot of effort and time, but it bears positive results. Mm. Well, I think that's fascinating, although in, I had a vision in my mind of a white rat, kind of, you know, like having been <laughs> dropped into your experimentation phase. I'm not sure that's not what you were doing at all. Um, Maria, um, forgive me, this data is a little bit old and, and please feel free to correct me if you have much fresher data because I, this is what I was able to find. But in 2019, um, the, the PwC did a, a responsible AI diagnostic survey. Um, and at that point, a couple of years ago, three years ago, the level of understanding and application of responsible and ethical AI practices was really quite immature. Mm -hmm. How have you seen that? progress? How have you seen that improve since, since then? Is there still more ground to cover? Because the, the kinds of uh, mitigating strategies that, that uh, Daniel and Juan are, are talking about here ultimately will need to be bought off right, by, by decision makers mm. inside the organisations that are paying for this work or commissioning this work. So I'm interested, how well does that group under, understand the challenge that they're potentially facing? We've made phenomenal progress, and I think it's due to COGEX, in events like COGEX, where we are able to bring on stages and raise awareness about how should we think about AI. And I think what, what Daniela was saying about bringing social sciences, uh, sciences but also to, uh, a different type of expertise into the mix is critical. But in order to do this, we need to reframe AI a little bit. I think for far, long, far too long, AI was with label a GPT, general purpose technology. But in fact, for a while we've been saying AI is a socio-technical system. And if you frame it in this way, naturally, you will need social scientists. So you don't have to fight to bring the social scientists in the place because that would be their role to work together with technologies. And I think we're not there yet in the business to have this definition, but since someone like NIST in the US, the standard institution, have said it out loud that we should think about AI in these terms, I'm hoping the trend will change. But I've seen conversations with our clients and the ways being framed that they understand we need to be thinking about collaboration. And in a way, we have been, we had these pockets of good practice, 
especially in innovation, but we don't, we don't know how to do it right other than a one-off, a product level. So how do we transform the culture so it becomes natural to engage with different experts? As you've pointed out, the experience in R squared is like, it's all about collaboration. Ethics is all about engaging with different audiences. It's about challenging the assumption or the hypothesis a, a, a scientist makes about a specific problems. And if you look at all the, the misuses of technology, at least the ones that have been in the media, the ones that someone like Cathy O'Neill has, has audited, the problem was neither with the data or the algorithms, or how the hypotheses were made, how you made the abstraction or complex social structure into a mathematical model is where things go massively wrong. So this is where the businesses are at the moment, it's understanding that's much more to AI that we considered before. There's a need to rethink how we approach AI being used not just as a transformative tool, but a disruptive tool. And how do you manage this transformation? But I think they are more prepared to it because they start to see the benefit. Mm -hmm. AI is delivering, is delivering the, on the promise with boring application of AI. But that gives confidence to business, business leaders that we are on the right track. More needs to be done, but I'm very excited to see that um, companies are picking up. One area where I wish them to be a bit more bold is to actually allocate budget for ethicists. Mm -hmm. I want to, to see more job position in a lot of companies that says AI ethicist or technology ethicist. I can't stress how important it is to have a person that is able to work with the technical team, with the social scientists, aggregate all those different views, but also being able to advise the business leaders on those issues. Now that really brings me on to, to an, the next question I wanted to ask, which is, in these contexts, when we're dealing with these kinds of societal questions, who gets to say when the ethically required standards have actually been met? Who, who has the authority to say, yes, that meets the standards we want as a society? What is, that, what is ethics? Well, quite. That's it. Yes, we, we have to start with, with that question. The fact that ethics is, is subjective, is linked with values, and we have mm. so many different value sets, and it's contextual. Uh, what is fair in one context, it will not be fair in another context. So I think we have to be very precise what we want to measure and how to we want to measure. And to be very, very precise what sort of a guardrails we want to set up and for what, guardrails for what. I think if we have that precision and framing and definition, they will be able to measure. And keep in mind, ethics is a qualitative layer we apply. How do, how do we quantify benefits mm. of an AI application? Mm. It's hard, so we have to, in order to quantify, we also have to have um, uh, quantitative measures. And how we establish that, that's probably a, a, a biggest challenge of all, especially mm. a fairness, right? I mean, I'm it, thinking back, sorry, Daniel, get, oh, go ahead. If, if that's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just um, entirely agree with what Maria say, was saying, and, and to, to add a, a bit of extra to it. So who gets to decide is fundamentally possibly one of the hardest questions and most important questions. It's partly to do with power. Mm. There's, there's power dynamics and asymmetry of power around decision making. We currently kind of centralize decision making in, frankly, a few companies um, in, in one tiny part of the world, or maybe two parts of the world, you know, uh, west coast of USA and, and east coast of China. Um, that is not the right model mm. for entirely right, a socio technical global system of systems. There are multiple socio technical systems which make up what we discuss as, as AI. Um, we need to begin to decentralize. We need to change the power dynamic. We need to uh, introduce participatory design. So when we talk about creating new products, the people who should be part of the process are the people who will be affected by that product. So if you're building a tool, or an application of some sort that will be used, let's say, uh, I come a lot, a lot from the health uh, data domain, let's say to analyze a disease that's prevalent in uh, Latin America, for lack of a better example, don't design that system in uh, Seattle or San Francisco. Design that system in, in, in Colombia. Yeah. Design a system with the people who are affected. Uh, have participatory design. So as an example, in data.org, we, we are building a set of open source tools for pandemic prevention called Epivus program. We have worked with universities in Colombia, Universidad Javeriana and Los Andes, with great um, scholars who are building the software there and working with the communities affected there to design it better. It's not only more equitable, mm. it's also more effective as products. Mm. 
I'm wondering if we need something, and we may already have this, and, and if so, please tell me, but I'm wondering if we need something the equivalent of, an, of the Hippocratic Oath but for AI development. Do mm. we need a first do no harm statement? Is that what we require? It's been a, such a, a mm. conversation for a long time in, in, in the data science field, and I think there was some attempt to draft that. I, I, I know of a... Uh, an attempt of that is called Munich Oxford Code of Conduct for Data Scientists. So check it out. It's, it's quite interesting. I think we might be able to have different governance uh, instruments we might use. And thinking about this uh, dynamic between global and local, one instrument that has been in the shade, didn't have much, a, a lot of attention, are standards. I've been working with ISO and BSI, also with IEEE. The standards are a very good instrument to standardize and create clear metrics for everyone in, in, in different types of contexts, standards and certifications. So watch out the space. UK government has such program on AI standards that's run by DCMS and uh, 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 Turing. So it would be very interesting how our experience in developing standards will be useful in offering us a way to measure different applications of different contexts and being able to have confidence that we have a certain level of quality. And I want, Juan, just to, to sum up this section now and before we throw it open to questions from the audience. Um, back to that, that idea about who gets to say when ethical standards have been met. You talked before about the, the criticality of having, um, of having explainable answers when, when you are using ML to, to make recommendations that, you know, pertinently and directly affect someone's life in an educational context, in a healthcare context, in a justice context. How, how do we get to a world where the individuals who might be the recipients of those decisions are involved in saying whether they feel comfortable with the ethical standards that those decisions have been made using? Hmm. So I guess, like, this is a... I guess like a question of, it goes back to the point that um, Maria made at the beginning about um, us needing to do more in the sense that we just need to build organizations that are able to take that kind of feedback and change how they operate. Mm. Um, and I think uh, we are very far away from being able to do that. Mm. I think that still that kind of responsiveness to someone being unhappy about the rationale for a decision is too downstream. Right. And I think that we need to go further upstream and think about um, in line with things that Daniel was saying as well. Um, it's almost like, how do we decide what type of AI system do we want to bring into, um, into an organization? And what is the purpose that this has? Uh, I guess my concern is that um, very often we bring AI systems into uh, social impact sectors from a perspective of efficiency and optimization mm -hmm. and saving costs and automating. Uh, and then we think that we could have explainable models and we could have fairness, but that, that isn't going to make the systems just mm -hmm. and actually addressing the needs of the communities that are a part of that sector uh, who are often the most vulnerable. So it's almost like how do we uh, start to think about how we use AI and bring AI into organizations, not just to do that optimization, but to do innovation, and in some cases transform these organizations rather than try to try and making them more efficient. Mm -hmm. And again, that's going to take a lot of uh, humility mm -hmm. from those organizations and their data scientists and a lot of participation in bringing those communities uh, into the conversation right from the beginning. Um, so, uh, yeah. There's a lot of work ahead. That's hugely thought-provoking. I mean, I, I, I understand that as saying, how do we build AIs for, for a societal outcome first, as opposed to a process optimization oh, yeah. outcome first, which is a really thought-provoking question. Um, at that point, I'd like to see if there are any questions from the audience. Yes, I can see a hand up. Uh, there, a couple of hands up for the lady at the back there, too. Please do go ahead. If you could let us know who, who you are, that would be great. Hi, I'm Louise Marston. I uh, work for Resolution Ventures, an impact investor. Are there some areas where AI should just steer clear? Uh, are there some, what are the characteristics of the problems where AI is not ready to be applied, where we should just be walking away from them right now because the capabilities aren't there? Go ahead, I, can, I, I can uh, throw out one great question. Um, 
I'm really nervous about surveillance of different types and, and, and applying AI in those spaces. We are not, as a society, uh, have not had enough time to work through the hard questions. Um, I, come, I was born in a to to totalitarian country. I am terrified by the prospect of a country, it was Soviet Union in my case, becoming really efficient, annoying what I'm doing every second of my life. One of the, one of the great benefits of the USSR was it was rubbish at bureaucracy and rubbish at, at, at internal, <laughs> internal surveillance. So, we, so citizens had some abilities to have private space. If you add AI surveillance at scale, efficient, effective, on top of that, that's a horrific dystopia. So I'm, I'm really worried about it. There's also issues around you know, racial biases, particularly, for example, in the US context, a great uh, amount of work done in that space. So surveillance for me is, is a real, um, it, it, it causes me to be really nervous. I think Maria wants to add something. Yes, I, 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 I found a very interesting concept. I'm stealing from one of my clients, so it's not mine. But they describe something in relation to how they use AI in their processes, moments that matter. Mm -hmm. And those moments that matter are interaction between humans that will nev should never be delegated to the machine. Being using AI in recruitment or being using to develop chatbots to interact with their employees and picking up whenever they are uh, in distress or have mental problems. Those are the moments that we should should capture or should lock us, never touched by the machine. I think we've, we've had this conversation, when, when do we use AI? To replace human or to augment humans, to automate? I think we need to have a little bit of a um, more honest conversation about what do we expect for those machines to do for us. And if we find areas that machines should never touch, don't do it. I'm, for example, I'm a big fan of classical music and I was very excited that they use AI to finish Beethoven 10th Symphony. I listened to it, nothing. Sounded like Beethoven, but nothing. So why should we allow AI to create music that don't go there? Music is, a, is, is, is an activity that's so human, it's not just about sounds, it's about can helping us connect with the environment, connect with each other. So I, I think it's important for us to be honest, where do we want the machines to do for us? And when do we allow the machine to come into What's, what's supposed to be um, human-led? Well, and you wanted to make a comment too, I think. Yeah, such a great question, Luis. Um, and I guess like leaving aside almost like use cases for AI which are frankly ethical no-nos, like emotion recognition. Obviously, like we, we have heard a lot about um, um, weapons and military systems. Uh, and moving towards almost like fuzzier areas. Like for example, areas where we know that it's very difficult to make good predictions about outcomes because they are so complex. Like for example, uh, what's going to happen in the life of a child based on their current situation. There was a very interesting project by um, uh, sociologists working with data scientists in Princeton, the Fragile Families Challenge, where they collected a lot of data and they tried to see whether they could predict children's outcomes using that data and they found, no, you can't predict because it's such a complex outcome. And I think in that case, then the question is, do you want to use machine learning if it's impossible to make predictions? And I would say, yes, you should use machine learning. But actually, this is just going to be something that generates some information, some signal for a human mm. who's going to be looking at this together with other data to make a decision. So basically, we are moving from a paradigm of uh, artificial intelligence, which is about automating, to a paradigm of intelligence augmentation, yeah. where the machine learning system is just creating additional information that helps an organization to make better decisions, even if sometimes the decision is to not do anything with the recommendation for the system because it's not reliable enough. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question. There was a lady with her hand up there at the back. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, my name's Charisma and I work for a sales intelligence startup. Um, one of the things you said at the start, which I thought was really interesting, was about vision. And I was wondering if you had any examples of sort of companies who you think have really good vision in terms of sort of how AI can impact the social sector and also sort of how they're executing on that vision. I'm not sure. Uh, you... So I'm not sure, not sure about um, a company, but I have a, a person in mind and an kind of academic team, which I, I wanted to bring up. So great. Um, collaborator of mine, uh, Regina Basile, 
who is based uh, at MIT uh, uh, C Cell School. Um, so great example of somebody who is an amazing innovator in terms of AI technical skills, but uh, is applying those skills in areas of social impact. So one of the things, she was part of the team that discovered Halicin, one of the antibiotics using ML approaches. Like that is an amazing, we, 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 we have too few antibiotics left in our arsenal to fight diseases as we get more resistance. Uh, that application is exactly the kind of things we should be doing. It is looking at structure of, of, of molecules, it is helping to speed up the process um, uh, of discovery, and it's, it's looking and targeting uh, an area of life all of us will be affected by as, 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 as diseases, uh, unfortunately, continue and become more resistant in the future. Uh, at the same time, she, she, in a different project, and this shows her versatility, she was using AI to, to decode an ancient Greek language. So it, it's just you know, creativity, amazing application in areas of, of real social need, great technical skills. So, the, so there are great people, great leaders in the space, and I'm sure there are also in companies um, uh, as well as in academia, and social impact sector uh, that we can all uplift. Mm. Mary? And perhaps they, they definitely do not need any spotlight because we all know they are great, but DeepMind is a good example, right? Their vision is to uh, solve intelligence and look at uh, AlphaFold, right? So the applications and having open source. I was on a, attended a panel um, yesterday and it just made me realize that how much they have opened, the, the sea of possibilities they've opened by doing this research, making it accessible, especially for countries that do not have um, um, technology capabilities. Um, like, for example, diseases that are very specific to a part of the world, and you have specialists in the field, and they wouldn't have the resources, and suddenly you have AlphaFold that offers you a lot for you to solve your problem. So I would say deep mind. Mm -hmm. And Juan, is there anyone you'd like to call out? Um, so I, I guess, like, actually, just to add to um, uh, Maria's point about DeepMind, I think something that's interesting, leaving aside the open source, um, amazing, like, like release a strategy with AlphaFold, is just the fact that they have adopted a very interdisciplinary, mm. uh, very uh, humanistic approach to how they think about uh, societal impacts of their technologies, and they are putting out lots of really cool papers uh, looking at how do you use causal models to look at bias, ethics of AI from a philosophical perspective. So a lot of thought leadership in that space uh, that's coming from them and really, I, I would say, uh, capturing the crossover hybridized hum humanistic spirit to doing AI, which I guess we have all been calling for in this panel. Mm, absolutely. I, I have a couple of candidates, and I think we'll, we'll close on those if we don't mind, but my couple of candidates, one would be Plan A, uh, Lamilla Jordanova, Jordanova um, runs Plan A, which is a, a startup looking at using AI to help organizations address their uh, carbon emissions, uh, which I think is a really interesting program of work. And they've just now launched in the UK, um, set up, I think, in Germany originally. Um, and then my second is an oldie and a goodie, Mitchell Baker, um, who was the founder of Mozilla. And many mm. of you in the room will remember Mozilla, um, the original creative commons of the internet. Um, and I think probably the, the grandmother of some of the ideas that we've been talking oh, yeah. about here today. So uh, if you haven't come across Mitchell Baker before, I would definitely go and look her up. Um, and at that point, I think we need to draw stumps. Uh, thank you so much for coming along to this session this morning. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank, please uh, thank my panel with a round of applause. Thank you very much. Please stay where you are right now. Um, this is the most exciting time for humanity, and just hearing you all talk about the challenges, hearing about ethicists needed to be part of this conversation is so important. And obviously, all the thoughts around Elon Musk. I do admittedly also work in the space sector when I'm not here, so it's always quite interesting to hear all the perspectives. Um, speaking about Plan A, we're joined by the CEO um, uh, later on today at 3 p.m. here, uh, festival stage two. <laughs> so if you'd like to hear from them, and I think, Caroline, th um, thank you so much. That's a wonderful shout out. Um, please join me in thanking our wonderful panel to Maria, to Daniel, to Juan, and to Caroline. Give them a massive round of applause. Thank you.
And we're going to be back here at 10 a.m. Um, for the next session, which is going to be on the next frontier in sustainability of data centers. Thank you very much.